Ao miracolo pi. Ampeto kin le mi chante eta wo wa glake. Na ha na pe chiusa pelo. This afternoon we'd like to talk about the Dakuwe exhibit and we subtitled an educational art exhibit about the Wounded Knee Massacre of 1890. And we want to focus on education as conveying facts about this event. Uh, and not just to non-Indians or to non-Lakotas, uh, all of us are, are um, and to some degree, ignorant about the Wounded Knee Massacre. So this is one thing we want to do, educate about the, uh, the events prior to, during, and after the massacre. We also want to educate about Lakota art and poetry and uh, music today, uh, not just looking at the past, but the present. So we'll cover some of these uh, issues. And this is the introduction to the exhibit. It's about the 1890 massacre of Lakotas at, at Wounded Knee. The Lakota word Dakuwe translates as why in English. And this came from Richard Red Owl. He was the, he's one of the artists in the exhibit and he's been in all of our exhibits up to this point. And after we talked about this exhibit and I asked him if he would like to participate, he said yes. And just as I was leaving, he said, one more thing, uh, any time he spoke to the elders about the Wounded Knee uh, uh, Massacre, he said they always would ask why. So I said, that's going to be the name of the exhibit, why? And so in Lakota, Dakuwe. So that's the title of this exhibit. And it's organized into these seven chronological uh, sections. The first section, belief, expresses the spiritual context of the ghost dance. Uh, assassination, the second section, uh, focuses on the early morning killing of Sitting Bull on December 15, 1890. The third section is Trek, and it covers the journey of Spotted Elk and his people from along the Cheyenne River toward Red Cloud's community in Pine Ridge uh, Reservation. The fourth and the middle section of the seven is Massacre, and it portrays the senseless killing of innocent Lakota children, women, and men on Monday, December 29, 1890, at Wounded Knee. The fifth section is interval, and that covers this period from immediately after the massacre until the burial, and that burial is the uh, sixth section called interment, and, and that occurred over two days, January 3rd and January 4th of 1891. The final section proposal offers an opportunity to reflect on the complex legacy of the massacre and looks forward to the ways in which Lakota citizens and Lakota tribes will continue to commemorate wounded knee. 46 contemporary Lakota citizens of five of the seven Lakota tribes in First Nation uh, are involved in this exhibit. And you can see from this map that they span east to west and from northern uh, plains up into Canada down to the southwest of the United States. So Lakotas live uh, throughout uh, North America and they're being represented in this exhibit. These are the, the artists, these Lakotas who are, are participating. There's 30 visual artists, uh, seven poets, and 11 musicians. There's seven songs, but uh, as you can see, uh, three of the songs have uh, either a duet or, or uh, three-person groups that are composing and, and performing the songs. The exhibit is, consists again of these seven sections. And so what I'd like to do is just share what these, uh, the content that is on uh, these section panels before we get to the artworks themselves. At the top of each of these uh, content panels is a number, uh, one through seven, and, and, and that crescent moon. And that this crescent moon is one of these icons, iconic symbols uh, associated with the ghost dance. Also, if you look, Closely, you can see there is how to pronounce, how to spell and pronounce that number in Lakota. So number two is pronounced Numpa. Numpa is number two. And each of these have a one word uh, title for that section, this one being assassination. Following assassination is the text of, of Cairns, uh, the Center for American Indian Research and Native Studies, describing that uh, portion, that chronological section of the exhibit. As we move down the page or the panel, 
On your left side, you'll see it gives us the date, and then the, the precise times of the sunrise and sunset, moonrise and moonset, and the uh, percentage of illumination of the moon. So in other words, the face of the moon. And then when it's available, oh, and the high and the low temperature. And then when it's available, we also have kind of a little bit of a weather report, like on Monday, December 15th, it was partly cloudy with a flurry of snow in the afternoon, followed by high winds. Now, we don't have that type of weather report for every day, but we do have that for most of the days. And then the red font, the red text, are the words of Lakotas at that time on that day. These are the words of these people remembering what happened that day. They were there. These are first-hand words, first-hand narratives about this event or each of the days that's represented in this narrative. Uh, this is something that we're bringing and presenting in a way I think that's not easily accessible for most people in the past. Uh, we always have a, usually academics that are talking or writing books and presenting kind of a objective viewpoint or the mostly the U.S. viewpoint. These are the Lakota's viewpoints. On the back of the panels or in a separate panel, you have this um, uh, colored form called a waveform. And this is a way to present sound, and in this case, particularly songs, in an exhibit. So this gives you the, the amplitude of a song that's vertical, and the duration of the song is horizontal. And then below the, the waveform is the poem associated with that section. In this case, it's the poem by Patrick Lebeau, Assignation with so that's how the uh, content panels are structured. And what we'll do now is go through these in chronological sequence and look at some of these artworks that are associated with each of these sections. So section one, Wan Chi. Wan Chi is how you say one. And uh, the, the, this section is called Belief. A delegation of Lakotas, including He Dog, Flat Iron, Yellow Knife, Brave Bear, Twist Back, Yellow Breast, and Broken Arm, along with Short Bowl and Kicking Bear, traveled in September of 1889 to Nevada to learn about the ghost dance from Woboka. They returned in March of 1890 and began sharing what they learned with residents of the Lakota reservations. Their version of the ghost dance was in some ways similar to the Lakota Sun Dance. But in other ways, it encouraged a wider range of people to participate. And so for belief, we'll look at three artworks uh, briefly. <laughs> the first uh, one is it's titled Hope, and it's by uh, Paul Zabel, a citizen of the Rosebud Sioux tribe. And here we can see this uh, combination of, of the sun dance and the ghost dance, starting from the bottom to the top. So he's showing this integration. At every Sundance, at the center pole of a Sundance grounds, there's two rawhide cutouts on, at every Sundance. One is of a human male, and one is of a buffalo male. And so that's what we see at the bottom. Human male, buffalo male, Sundance. Above that, we see ghost dance, the icons of a, of, of of the ghost dance, a crescent moon, we can see that at the top, a messenger between the people and the spirits, and in this case, it's a thunderbird or a bird, sometimes it will be a dragonfly, and then stars, and seven stars, we have four on one side and three on the other. So, uh, uh, Paul Zabo's uh, picking up on this idea of that the sun dance and the uh, ghost dance uh, were similar in many ways. The second piece we'll look at here is called uh, Hope Also, and then in parentheses, Wape, which is the Lakota word for hope. And this is by Roger Brower, a citizen of the Ogallala Sioux tribe. And from top to bottom, we see this blue uh, suggestion of a crescent, but it could also be the neckline of a ghost dance shirt. So we could be looking at a shirt <laughs> or not, but we see the, the idea of a crescent moon a thunderbird, a messenger right in the middle, and then stars, and he depicts them in two ways. Towards the top, the stars are more uh, pointed ends, and then towards the bottom, we can see the two stars that are more like plus signs, also more like Christian crosses. 
And then the power of that Thunderbird is these uh, uh, lightning bolts coming out from its legs. And then the third piece we'll look at is called Wounded Knee Three by Arthur Amiad, another Oglala Sioux tribe citizen. And we also see that piece right here. <laughs> and it's, uh, you have these uh, four uh, kind of uh, horizontal uh, vignettes. And this first one is the landscape of Wounded Knee. Uh, uh, I think he's trying to uh, give the depiction that this is how it was a long time ago. This is how it is today. If you're close, you can see that uh, Bear Butte is represented. That's a, this is a photograph of you see Bear Butte. So here we have the, the landscape of, of, of Wounded Knee. At this level, we have the ghost dance, images of the ghost dance. And we have Kicking Bear and uh, Short Bull and Wovoka and Sitting Bull and Bigfoot. These are the key uh, characters of this narrative. And then at this level, we see the, the photographs that were taken of the killing field after the massacre. These are two of the famous photos. And then at this level here, we can see the soldiers. And then on this side, this is the dedication in 1903 of a monument. When the United States <laughs> buried the, the Lakota's bodies who still remain, uh, they, they, it was an unmarked grave. They did not mark it in any way. One of the survivors, Joseph Horncloud, uh, paid for, designed and paid for, and erected this monument on his own in 1903. And 5,000 Lakotas attended that uh, dedication. And then uh, here we see the churches. This is our Holy Cross uh, church that was made into a uh, temporary hospital on, on the evening of December 29th to... Uh, where people could take care of the, the, the survivors of the massacre. So, Arthur Amia, Wounded Knee Three. So, the, third, the second section then, uh, in number two, Numpa, Numpa in Lakota, is assassination. In the early dawn of Monday, uh, December 15, 1890, Sitting Bull was killed outside of his home along the Grand River in Standing Rock Reservation. Other civilians killed were Blackbird, Catch the Bear, Little Assiniboine, Crowfoot, Spotted Horn Bull, Brave Thunder, and Chase Wounded. Indian policemen killed were Bullhead, uh, Little Eagle, Afraid of Soldier, John Armstrong, and David Hawkman. So for this uh, section, we'll look at two uh, non-visual art pieces. The first will be a poem and the second will be a song. The poem is Assignation with Sitting Bull by Patrick LeBeau. He's a Cheyenne River Sioux tribe citizen, and we'll just listen to the first uh, uh, part of this poem. Assignation with Sitting Bull. Bullet hole in cabin. Bullet hole in head. Bullet hole in cabin. Sitting Bull is dead. Tolerant of Waboka dreams emerging from the West, tolerant of Catholic prayers for rays from the East, tolerant of ghost dance high-stepping from the West, tolerant of McLaughlin prancing from the East, Western cannon intruders pressing on fate, piercing sun dancer, defender of the gate. Bullet hole in cabin, bullet hole in head, bullet hole in cabin, sitting bull is dead. So this is Patrick Laveau's uh, a long poem here. Uh, all this part we listen to is about a sitting bull. And the song that we're going to hear is an honor song for sitting bull that uh, Cedric Goodhouse, a, a Standing Rock Sioux Tribe uh, a citizen, recorded for us. It's a song he said was composed when Sitting Bull was alive and then has been passed down all these generations, 130 years to him. Uh, and so we can see in the waveform a traditional Lakota song. The number four is really critical in Lakota songs. You'll have four parts, four parts, four parts, four parts, and it's done. And if you look in this first part here, it's going to be one, two, three, four parts. 
Then there's space, and that's all vocables. Then we're going to hear the words in Lakota. One, and a two, three, four here. So we'll listen to this first segment of the song, and I'll try to point as, as it's going along. But this is one of these things that we can only do if we exhibit these songs in this way, or we can start to... In, we can't even imagine how to use these educationally, but it's, it's been fascinating to see the structures of these songs. So we're starting right here at the beginning. So that's one segment of the song. It looks like two big segments, or uh, in each of those segments, composed of four parts. But again, we can look at this and just visually. Uh, we should think that's a traditional song. And we'll be able to compare that to other songs uh, later on. Uh, section three, Yamini. Yamini. Uh, it's titled Trek. Uh, at the end of section two, that's on that day, December 15th, Sitting Bull is killed by Indian policemen sent by McLaughlin. So uh, immediately after that is where Trek starts, and that's where we start. So Sitting Bull's followers fled south to Cherry Creek and Shine River Reservation. Most of them went east with Hunt to Fort Bennett. Some went west and joined Spotted Elk's people. Spotted Elk, also known more popularly as Bigfoot, decided to lead this community of over 300 citizens of the Hunkpapa, Manikanju, Ohenupa, Sihasapa, and Itazicho Oyates to Red Cloud's community in Pine Ridge Reservation. They left Cheyenne River on Tuesday, December 23, 1890. The following Sunday afternoon, December 28th, they, uh, about 20 miles from their destination, they were intercepted by the U.S. 7th Cavalry near Porcupine Butte, which we've seen right here, uh, near Porcupine Butte and taken to Wounded Knee. So we'll look at three artworks for this, two visual artworks and a song. This is Trek by Renell White Buffalo, a citizen of the Rosebud Sioux tribe. And uh, this <laughs> very abstract uh, piece by Renell, and uh, depending on how you want to look at it, I guess, you can read it right to left. And if so, you kind of see maybe that this is this period of, of, of confusion. The, the Lakotas are, con these Lakotas are confused about what's going on. They've just killed a major leader, Lakota leader, getting ready to now travel uh, down to another major leader. So you, you could see that the, the, the typical daily behavior, which is on the very far right side, becomes uh, uh, very different. Or you can read it left to right of all this confusion time. What are we going to do? What are we going to do? They make a decision. We're going to go to Pine Ridge. Either way, I think you can read that. Uh, the second piece, Cold Travel by Donald Montalo, Oglau Sioux Tribe citizen. And he's depicting this idea of snow. And some of the time during that travel, there was snow and bitter cold temperatures. And if you look closer, you can see like here, here's a rider with a hood. And then here's the face of the horse. So um, uh, the you're looking, these riders are coming directly at you, these three riders here, one, two, three. So kind of in this, again, this uh, amorphous, um, uh, strange uh, milieu, these uh, people are having to move uh, and choosing to move down to Pine Ridge. 
And this is a song by the Wake Singers uh, called Prelude to a Massacre. The Wake Singers consist of three individuals for this song, Michael Tubles, Douglas Tubles, and Grant Tubles, all cousins. And they're all citizens of the Oglala Sioux tribe. And we'll just play a little bit of this. Trying to get a, well, uh, here we go. Now this isn't how most Lakota songs start by stereotype, right? <laughs> And then we're going to hear a cello in here. <laughs> and this is just not how Lakota music is supposed to be, right? We're right about here. Mm -hmm. Is this is Lakota music. This is talking about uh, the massacre, but it's doing it in a way none of us could imagine. So this is one of these educational aspects of this exhibit that we're trying to uh, facilitate. We can't, we don't enable it, but we facilitate it because we ask these contemporary Lakotas to reflect on specific aspects of this exhibit and they do it in their own way. So that I just think is like a, a pop tune that should be on the radio. All right, section four is the massacre itself, the center of, of seven sections. The middle one is the massacre, four in Lakota is pronounced Dopa. So Dopa, Dopa, massacre. On an unseasonably mild Monday morning, December 29, 1890, the US military gathered Spotted Tail and all of his men with him uh, for a meeting. Uh, soldiers surrounded this council ground and the entire Lakota camp. So they, had, they surrounded the council ground and they also surrounded the entire Lakota camp. The, these men and the women in the camp were disarmed by the soldiers. Uh, a shot was fired mid-morning and then for the rest of the day, uh, Lakotas were killed. When the soldiers left Wounded Knee at sunset, more than 300 uh, children, women, and men were dead. So the, one of the things that our research has shown and really uh, works against the stereotype is that it wasn't cold. It was a nice weather-wise day, 66 degrees, mostly sunny, not bitter cold and snow. Most people don't know this. Uh, most books don't present that. Most encyclopedias don't have it that way, but th those are the facts. And uh, that's why I really appreciate this about uh, Charles for many horses piece called The Women and Children, is that the, the landscape, the weather that's being depicted is, is accurate, I think. You have tree leafless trees, you have blue sky, and you have dry grass color, somewhere browns and greens. And you have soldiers killing women and children. Uh, those are the facts. The second piece we're looking at here is by uh, Kevin Puyer, another Ogla Sioux tribe citizen, uh, called Spirits of Wounded Knee. This is a buffalo horn. Kevin's the leader in, in, in carving and texturing buffalo horn. And so this is a buffalo horn with all these spirits, these wavy body shapes. These are the spirits that have been killed, massacred. And he drilled a hole through each one of them, so that, like a bullet hole through each of these uh, spirits. So this is that day of the massacre. The other thing that our research showed was that the soldiers uh, killed until, or at least kept shooting and hunting down people until dark. And that is something that a lot of the histories uh, don't mention. Most of them will mention that the killing ended real soon uh, after it started. But there is no evidence from Lakota side or from the logic side, meaning uh, according to the uh, Lakota accounts, the soldiers went back to, uh, they stayed at Wounded Knee until dark and then returned to Pine Ridge. 
and we know they return to Pine Ridge after nine o'clock, and it's a 16 mile uh, distance from Wounded Knee to Pine Ridge. So in order for them to get there after dark, they would have had to been at Wounded Knee until around 4.30, which is when the sun set that day. If they had finished killing at, at, around noon, they should have been back to Wounded Knee by five o'clock, four or five o'clock. So all the Lakota accounts seem to have uh, the evidence overwhelmingly in their favor that the killing went on all day. So section five, Zaptan, Zaptan, interval. The military left Wounded Knee around sunset with wagons of wounded soldiers and some Lakota survivors of the massacre. Their destination was Pine Ridge. They arrived after 9 p.m. The pews of Holy Cross Episcopal Church were removed and straw was strewn on the floor for the wounded who, had, who were laid down and tended to by Dr. Charles Eastman, a Dakota physician, and other assistants. That was on December 29th. A, biz, a blizzard blew in on New Year's Eve, and then the next day, January 1st, 1891, Dr. Eastman and around 100 other men traveled back to Wounded Knee where they found and saved 11 people. Two days later, began the burial of the bodies remaining at Wounded Knee. So it was that blizzard on New Year's Eve uh, that caused Dr. Eastman and others to say, hey, there might be some people still living that we should go try to save, and they did on, on New Year's Day, 1891. With those hundred men on, it, on New Year's Day, 1891, were photographers. That's where we get the photographs. That's where we get these photographs here. And this, as you can see, is uh, this image of, uh, this is a painting, this is the piece by uh, Angela Babby, Ogallala Sioux Tribe citizen, called Win Never Again. And you can see the soldier in the teepee right here. And she said when she first seen this uh, photo, she thought, look at all those blankets piled up. And she realized these were bodies. And so then in her piece, she, she focuses the color on the people and their blankets. And then this is a poem that was uh, written. I'll just let her introduce herself. I think this poem will just let it run all the way through. The Dark Side of December by Mary Blackbonnet. A chasm exists for Lakotas between Christmas and New Year, between Christian and savage, between red and white, burned into our hearts our minds, our memories, even if we weren't there. December 29th, 1890. Wounded Knee Creek, the earth stained red with the blood of our people. If you listen, you can hear the terrified cries of innocent babies, moccasin and boot alike, running, the staccato pop and crack of firearms muffled thud of bodies falling to the ground, souls torn from bodies, only to be bound to earth, trapped in a memory as bitter as the December winds, forever burned into the collective unconscious of every Lakota since that day. Please celebrate your holidays, ring in your new year, but send a prayer a song, a whisper, for mothers, sisters, babies, brothers, and husbands lost, heinous, tragic, everlasting. Right, so that was section uh, five, and section six, shock pay, shock pay, and I'll put the section six, interment. A group of civilians was hired to bury the Lakota bodies that remained at Wounded Knee. The interment took two days, January 3rd and January 4th of 1891. The, bur the burial party dug a trench six feet wide, 72 feet long, and five feet deep. The bodies were piled into this mass grave atop the hill overlooking the massacre site. This is the fenced-in grave that is at the site today. If you go there, you will, this is uh, on the hill and that's fenced in. We'll see that in an artwork right here. So we're going to look at two artworks. Uh, 
uh, for this section, Quilt Made in Memory by Andrea Leckberg and Frances Davidson, a daughter and mother, both uh, Ogallow Sioux Tribe citizens. Uh, they sewed this quilt out of fabrics that um, probably were familiar, at least in the pattern in 1890s. And then they brought it out to the reservation, and this is them in December of 2018, uh, and buried it. This beautiful quilt, and they buried it there. And then the next morning, it's, or overnight, it snowed, and this is the morning after they buried it. And you can see the fresh snow over the, over the, the rectangle where the quilt is. And then they said they were going to come back and excavate it before the exhibit. The exhi this was the very first time the exhibit was going to open in um, um, March of, of 2018. So they said they'd come back. Well, they didn't. And so <laughs> my cousin Glenn and I had to excavate it. And here's Glenn working on excavating it. Here we have all the uh, top cover off and you can see the quilt there. And then it went on exhibit. And then last summer, summer of 2019, it, there was a spell between uh, venues. So Andrea, this is Andrea, came back and reburied the quilt uh, on a really hot uh, August day. And then she said she'd come back to excavate it, but of course she didn't. <laughs> and so another friend, Dan, and I had to excavate, but the ground was frozen. And so uh, we actually had to put a heater on it for all overnight to heat the ground enough so that we could uh, get the quilt out. And here's Dan pointing to roots had grown through the quilt and then up against the quilt and out. And also some of the uh, fabric stayed in the ground when, when it was ex excavated. And this quilt then was on display at the... Uh, Holter Museum of Art in Helena, and now it's here uh, in, in the Britain Museum uh, here in Bighorn. The other artwork for this section interment is this piece called Iksuya by Michael Tubols, an Ogallala Sioux Tribe citizen. And it's one of these uh, multi layers, kind of like Arthur did. They, these recall each other to me, there's this multiple layers of, of meaning and imagery. Uh, at the bottom, what looks like the ground is actually a view of the Badlands um, of South Dakota, uh, where the, some of these ghost dancers uh, in a place called the, the Stronghold, where they were able to protect themselves from the military. Coming out of that ground is this uh, double helix, uh, like this double DNA double helix coming right through the cemetery. This is the cemetery contemporary times if you go there'll be a chain link fence around the mass grave and then there's this uh, archway that uh, the catholic church had put up long long time ago uh, way after the massacre but there and then out of that double helix become this red uh, freeform line that then is uh, attached to the foot of this uh, magpie that's flying away and also here's that church this is that holy cross church upside down Pointing down. All right, we're at section seven, the final section, Shakoin. Shakoin is seven in Lakota proposal. Since the massacre, Lakotas have sought to commemorate their relatives who were senselessly slaughtered at wounded knee. Initially, people placed a marker where each person died. Later, a monument funded mostly by a survivor of the massacre, Joseph Horncloud, was erected at the site. Soon afterwards, the Wounded Knee land was allotted to tribal citizens, and almost immediately thereafter, some of it was converted to fee status and alienated from tribal control. A national park has been proposed, maybe now, over a century afterwards, Lakota tribes will protect the land and appropriately and respectfully commemorate their citizens who were killed at Wounded Knee. So we'll listen to a poem. And then we'll look at this final artwork before we move on with the presentation. This is a poem called The Proposal by Autumn White Eyes, an Ogallala Sioux Tribe citizen. 1890. 
The date shakes through me every time I hear it taking me back to the screens and blood as though I were actually there. We are transported by our DNA. Feeling it creep through us in constant reminders as we pass by the grave site. Reminders as we breathe in the cold wind chill, every Pine Ridge winter storm drifting through trailer windows. I am transported back. They say they were mostly women and children, women, the cultural bearers, children, the leaders of the next generation, living resistance. The last free Lakota. Do you know what it's like to feel your ancestors under your skin? Do you see the shine of their guns in the 20 medals 7th Cavalry were awarded? Do you honor them? Placed on your mantles with passed down stories of how Grandpa killed the last free Indians, let us heal. Walk me through wounded knee and thoughts of resistance, resilience, survival. Sink my feet into ground that moccasins dance over. Hearing their heart beat under a drum. I want to propose a place to heal. Give me a place to mourn, not a grave. Five feet deep, six feet wide. 72 feet long, give me a place to make sense of it all. A way to honor them. And let us heal. This is uh, artwork by Keith Braveheart, an Ogallaw Sioux Tribe citizen. Wowichala Ichiwa Yankapi is, is the title of this piece. And the main a uh, figure here is a, is a woman, uh, I think a Lakota woman today, with what most of us have, a cell phone, taking a selfie of herself, and in the background is something about wounded knee. Uh, and this is a sign that exists up there right by uh, Porcupine View, and it, it's titled Big, uh, Chief Bigfoot Surrenders, and it explains that where, where from this sign that, that surrender, quote unquote, was. And so here's a person, I think that Keith is depicting a person that's um, maybe uh, unaware of the full history of the Wounded Knee Massacre. No fault of her own, maybe, and no fault of all of us that did this exhibit, participated in it in one way or another. We learned a lot. This is the uh, power of educational art exhibits. And also, uh, when we're talking about this idea of uh, power or education, it's one thing to read a poem, it's so much different to be able to hear these poets uh, read the poem. So there's one thing we're really stressed in our exhibits is, is trying to get the voices uh, of Lakotas, of these artists or, and or the poets uh, in front of us, the, the audience. So that's the, uh, the artworks that I selected to talk about these seven sections. These are thumbnail images of the rest of the artworks uh, that were created for the exhibit by the other uh, visual artists. And here's an image showing the seven songs, the waveforms for the seven songs. Um, so you can compare them. You can compare uh, one through seven. This is uh, section one to section seven, top to bottom. And the second one was the, uh, uh, the honor song by Cedric Goodhouse, the honor song for Sitting Bull. And then the one right below it was this shorter song, a Prelude to a Massacre by the Wake Singer. So again, this gives us a chance to talk about music or songs in a, in a, a different way other than just trying to listen to it. And then these are the seven poems that were uh, authored by poet, Lakota poets for the exhibit. Just to, it's unfortunate that in a presentation like this, I have to just select some and I can't show all. So, encourage you to look at the rest of the artworks in these exhibits. And then this is the final artworks in the exhibit. And this is a effort of trying to uh, be more inclusive with Dakuwe. There's a, people want to make a response. People want to participate. And what we decided is that we would allow people to participate by creating artworks and they could create these artworks. Um, in a way, it harkens back to this uh, a drawing. This was done by Mary Wright in 1891. November of 1891, she went to Wounded Knee and she seen all these sticks uh, out wherever a body was, relatives had stuck a stick in the ground. 
and the, she called these memory sticks. So what we know is that Lakotas have been commemorating or marking where their relatives died or were killed right away, starting in 1891 and up until now. There's still this idea of, of recognizing that this happened, not forgetting. So there must have been about 300 sticks in the ground over everywhere. So what we think is we're trying to get 300 artworks uh, in the exhibit be analogous to those 300 who were killed. And uh, one of the ways to do this is through these uh, uh, squares. These are five by five squares. If you're interested in creating a square, you contact our organization, we'll send you a square. And if you do an artwork and send it back to us, we'll pay you an honorarium of $12.29, which is a clever way of December 29th, right? Then we'll also give you a, uh, an exhibit catalog. And then, uh, and then we ask you to uh, title your piece and give a, a price. Uh, so they're all for sale. And then answer two questions. Why do you want to participate? And uh, how is your piece tied reflective or linked to the massacre? So I want to share two of these there's over 200 of these. I want to share two of them uh, with you today. So this, uh, the top one here is by a, a man named John Redis. And I just wanted to uh, point a couple things. So uh, why? Why did you want to participate? I grew up off the res, but always came back. And this is the first time I've ever had an opportunity to transfer thought to paper regarding Native people past. This is what we see over and over by the artists poets and musicians who participate in these exhibits is they've never been asked to create artworks so important because it's about topics that are so important. Uh, they're not creating them to necessarily sell. Of course, they would love it if they have sold, <laughs> but they're doing it in, because of the, the topic is what they're doing, these four. Now, here's uh, John's artwork, uh, his square, that's a five inch square. And then just one other comment about it. I mean, you can read all this, but uh, he says the plant, the plant growing out of the skull in his artwork is representative of an idea that despite everything that happened, we can be strong and create beauty. Now, this makes me think of this piece by Anne Erica Whitebird. It's called Let Them Live Through Us. That's part of this exhibit. Anne Erica is a Rosebud Sioux Tribe citizen, and uh, she makes this... This is a prison shirt uh, uh, reconfigured or reimagined as a ghost, a modern ghost dance shirt. So on the yoke, we see the uh, icons of the symbols of, of uh, ghost dance, right? We see stars, two stars and a crescent moon, and then these uh, um, dragonfly messengers uh, on the sides here on this prison shirt. It's important to remember, in 1883, the United States outlawed Native religions, all Native religions. So the ghost dance and the sun dance were outlawed. They were, not, they were illegal in, in 1883. So in 1890, at the massacre, the time of the massacre, these people were breaking the law. They could have been put in jail. Well, what is interesting here is that John Redis is in prison in South Dakota, and American Indians are way overrepresented in prisons in South Dakota proportionally. But the, he's one of these uh, over 200 individuals who are participating in this project. We have prisoners, men and women from South Dakota prisons involved. We have the youngest is a 10 year old girl, the oldest is in their 80s. Uh, uh, professional artists and just laypersons, anyone. It's in, it, we're, we don't discriminate by uh, who you are or what you are. Uh, just like the massacre didn't discriminate, it's indiscriminate killing. So uh, I like the, this analog here of, of uh, Mr. Redis uh, with uh, Anne Erica Whitebird's piece. The second square is by Arthur Running Horse. And that, again, that's a five inch square. Golden Future, it's called. Uh, why did you create this? I chose to do artwork for this exhibition because I want to represent my people. And how is this tied to the massacre? He says, my artwork is tied to the 1890 Woundedy Massacre by representing that we shall have a future. 
Now, when I look at that, that those things don't come to my mind, right? I mean, <laughs> I don't think most people would look at that square and think, oh, this represents the Lakota people. And uh, this shows that Lakotas have a good future in front of them. But to him, it does. And I would like to think, and I have no evidence for this. He, first of all, I guess I should say he's a student uh, uh, at Red Cloud Indian School. Uh, I haven't spoken to him about this, but I wonder if he's seen this piece first. This is called The Descent by Lathina Latoka. She's a Standing Rock Sioux Tribe citizen, and she did this for Dockaway. And I just hope that the influence is uh, Athena <laughs> to Arthur, uh, one of the benefits of this exhibit, that you don't have to paint a certain way to be a Lakota painter. You don't have to compose music in a certain way to be a Lakota musician. You don't have to write poetry in a certain way to be a Lakota poet. This is one of the educational aspects we're trying to get across to our exhibits is diversity within this category called Lakotas. So that's the end of the exhibit uh, in its uh, totality, I guess. But I do want to mention a couple more things that are related to it. And these you can see by going to the uh, Karen's website. And if you go to the Karen's website, you can click on the Dockaway uh, logo down here and that'll uh, take you to this uh, page and then on this page if you want to see all of the squares that have been created you can click on uh, square artworks and it'll give you all of the squares you can see images of all of the squares and you can see uh, read all the names of the artists of those squares you can also go to an online exhibit that has everything that we've talked about today and and more is, is in this online exhibit. You can listen to the poets, read their poems, you can listen to the musicians, uh, perform their songs, you can see all the artwork. So that's all available in the online exhibit. And then there's curriculum. And again, this ties so strongly to this idea of education. So if you click on education, you come up to this page and we have four core uh, educators uh, who, who, are, who developed curriculum, classroom activities for each of these, for K-12, for each of these sections, the seven sections, and then overall. And uh, I just want to mention their names. So left to right the, is uh, Mabel Peacott. Next to her is uh, <laughs> not one of the uh, educators in the sense of uh, K-12 educators, but this is Lynn Versure. Uh, who was the uh, executive director of the South Dakota Art Museum. Next to her is Lorraine Wooster, uh, and then Perry Strain, and then Deanna Stans. So it's uh, Mabel, uh, Lorraine, Perry, and Deanna that are the core educators um, of the exhibit. And then Blanche helped uh, initially with our, with our work of developing these. And so this is what, it, if you click on the uh, uh, curriculum, for you can see for each section, there's all these um, activities. And then if you click on any of those, you get the activity and the grade levels it's and content and skills and understandings and procedures. So all of this is available for free on the Karen's website. One other way that we try to extend the educational reach of these exhibits is through what we call these community-based uh, versions of the exhibit. And these can be put up in school libraries, which we can see at the top, conference rooms over here at the top right. Um, uh, this is in a lobby of a healthcare facility in Sioux Falls, and this is in a tribal cultural center, the Lakota Cultural Center uh, in the Sh uh, Shine River Reservation. These are reproductions of the images and, and they can be put anywhere to extend this outreach. So that's uh, the wrap up of the overall of this uh, document. Really want to thank the Brenton Museum for hosting this exhibit and also for making possible this uh, this video about the document exhibit. So Wolfie Latonka, uh, thank you very much.